Genesis chapter 31. Let's continue on in this teaching right here. Genesis chapter 31. As you might recall, we left off where Jacob is trying to persuade his wives, Rachel and Leah, to leave with him and that Laban, staying with him, is a bad idea and it is not the will of God. So he was acting like a prophet and then obviously when you read his little prophecy or sermon that there's just some errors in there or faults. As a matter of fact, he could have been stoned to death if it was the Old Testament. I could be wrong about that, but he was giving some errors in the prophecy where in the Old Testament they took it very seriously. So now we're going to see Rachel and Leah's response in Genesis chapter 31, and we'll read verse 14. And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him. So Rachel and Leah, they answer and they say to Jacob after he tells them and tries to convince them that, hey, this is God's will that we got to leave. Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? So there, they asked him a question. Is there anything left, any part or anything of what we inherited in, uh, when we stay here with our father in his home? So obviously it's a rhetorical question, no. Verse 15, are we not counted of him strangers? For he has sold us. So Rachel and Leah, they also ask this question. Doesn't he see us as not really his daughters, but as strangers, people who have no relation to him? Because he sold us. Now you might recall that Laban, that he made a monetary deal with Jacob. You work for me seven years, your payment will be my daughter. So Laban did sell his uh, daughters, and actually he, uh, he was the one that gave Leah away to Jacob, even though Jacob and Leah would not even want anything to do with that. So Laban was the one in control of all of that. Obviously then, Laban is at fault, and he treated his daughters like strangers and sold them. Verse 15, the next part, and hath quite devoured also our money. Rachel and Leah complains that Laban, he devoured, he consumed all of their income. Verse 16, for all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. In this passage, Genesis 31, 16, Rachel and Leah say that all of their uh, incomes, their riches, everything that they have, God took away from Laban and gave it to them. They acknowledge that. They agree with Jacob on that because Jacob, remember, he argues all these riches like, God, I didn't steal it from your dad. The Lord gave it to me. Now, part of it is true, but part of it is false. Because remember, Jacob did something sneaky where he can make sure Laban's income shrinks and his increases. I'm not going to get on that one. That was a lot of complications. Verse 16, uh, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God has said unto thee, do. Rachel and Leah answer to Jacob that uh, the, all the riches God took away from their father Laban and everything that they have and the children now own from Laban is actually theirs. God gave it to them. And she's, uh, not she, they say that whatever God tells you to do, then we're going to follow it. Just do it. Verse 17, then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. So Jacob, he rises up and then he places his sons and his wives on their camels and then they all go out. Now, remember this is that if my explanation sounds a little dull to you, the reason why is because I'm trying to explain each and every word in the verse, okay? So in your mind, you might be thinking, why do you have to explain that part to us? We already know that. The reason why is the complaint nowadays in this generation is the Bible is too hard to understand. I don't understand every word in the verse. So that's the reason why I'm explaining every word. 
So see if my explanation matches with the verse. When you look at the verse, hear my explanation. And you might see something. And then you'll go, oh, that's what it means. So it'll be helpful to you. Verse 18, and he carried away all his cattle and all his goods, which he had gotten. In verse 18, J Jacob, he now carries, and then he go, uh, carries away from Laban all of his uh, stuff, his cattle, all of his goods that he got himself. So it's important to realize the Lord didn't give it to him. He got it himself. The cattle of his getting. The Holy Spirit writes, he got the cattle himself. You might recall, he did something weird to steal Laban's cattle. Which he had gotten in Padanaram for to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. So all these goods and cattle he got in Padanaram, which is where he's currently living with Laban. And now he's going to go to Isaac, his father, where he lives in Canaan. Verse 19, and Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. So while Laban was away shearing his sheep, Rachel took the opportunity to steal his father's idols. Now, there are some three interesting factors that I want to cover with this stealing that Rachel did. First things first is notice that Rachel, when she steals the images, people might be wondering, what are her intentions, right, to steal the images? So one could be probably obvious. She's just getting back at her father, right? She's just upset, getting back, vengeance. Well, that's very likely. That's very likely that she would do that. But I'm thinking that there's a second thing as well. There's a second thing as well. The reason why is... Remember, she gave the statement earlier, whatever is her father's is actually hers now. So she's going to claim what rightfully belongs to her. Now, in anybody's mind, they're like thinking, who would want a dumb idol? Shouldn't Rachel know better? Because she prayed to the Lord, remember? She knows who the true God is, and that true God granted her request on uh, having children. You know what's going on right here? She still had that secular cultural mindset. Like many women nowadays in this modern generation and age, she still had that problem. It never left her. Did you recall? Here are some examples that we noticed in Rachel's case, right? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 30. And then verse 14, Genesis chapter 30. And we'll read verse 14. Remember that mandrakes is just as idolatrous and pagan as the images, the mandrakes, because people thought, if I have this, I'm going to be more fertile. That was the pagan idolatr idolatrous teaching because the mandrake had the form of a human being. So then they assumed that if I eat this, then a human will uh, be born out of me. But verse uh, 14, And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Verse 15, Rachel makes a deal with Leah at the last part of verse 15. And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. She says to Leah, If you give me the mandrakes, I'll give away my husband to you for the night. So she follows her, La uh, her father, Laban, in that sly mindset, that secular cultural mindset where there's total reliance on self and in the worldly ways of doing things. That's why God never blessed her. Going back to Genesis 31, Genesis 31. So we see right here she still could not get rid of her fleshly nature. Her secular mindset. Let every woman who is influenced by this modern secular world study Rachel. That's the best advice I can give to you. You can glean a lot from her. You have to look at your practice, your actions, your conversation, sisters, if you follow the worldly ways of a woman. So study Rachel's life. It will be eye-opening. Let's look at Genesis chapter 31. 
and we will read verse uh, 19 again. Rachel steals the, notice what the Bible says, images, images. Uh, why is that important, that wording? Well, let's go back to the beginning. The beginning is, this is the first time idols are mentioned. Didn't you know that? It's not in Genesis 6. It's not in Genesis 6 where uh, the whole world was drowned by the flood because of their wickedness and these gods came down. Idolatry is first mentioned right here in this passage. Now you might go, why is it at the Abrahamic, the patriots time, the patriarchs, not patriots, patriarchs time, that this is first mentioned, not in Adam's time, not in Noah's time. There's a reason for this. Let's return to Acts 19. Uh, let's go to Acts 19, excuse me, not return. Let's go to Acts 19, please. Sorry, I, uh, my brain is not really functioning today. So you all bear with me if I uh, say some wrong sure. words here and there, okay? Yeah. All right, Acts chapter 19. Thank you, thank you. This church has always been encouraging. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, I love it too, amen. <laughs> Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, and then I want you to look at this verse, at verse 35, verse 35. Acts chapter 19 and verse 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from where? Jupiter. Now, notice right here that this person, this pagan from Ephesus, told all the Ephesians and claimed that this God that we worship, these gods come from outer space, Jupiter. But they call that God image, which fell down from Jupiter. Remember, the images, the idols are supposed to represent gods. That could explain why. During Noah's time, during Noah's time period, there are no images. They came down and they were present. Why would they make images then after Noah's flood? They're not there anymore. So then they have to make these images to retain their worship. Why do you think Satan loves idolatry? He loves it because it retains worship to them, because they can't be present there. It's not their time yet. The tribulation didn't start yet. It will happen, though, because we're getting very close. There are people worshiping idols today. Yep. That's right. The Atlantic mentioned a post that atheists can be more religious than Christians yes, yes. because of these pop idols and Hollywood idols and etc. Yep. So already people have that affinity with a person to yep. worship to adore. Wait till the real thing comes, not just a fallible human or a weak human. That's going to be scary. Now go to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. It's not idols. It's gods. Notice that the Bible calls it sons of God. They come down and they're present in the world. Genesis chapter 6 and then we'll read verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Notice that in this passage, the sons of God came down on the earth and then married the women in this world. Let's go back. Let's go back. That's why God had to drown it all out. That's why Satan wants to do idolatry. It retains it. You might ask, oh, where did idolatry come from? Where did it begin then after Noah's flood? I believe it, it came from Nimrod and Semiramis. Nimrod and Semiramis, they were the ones that started that Babylonian religion. That's where Roman Catholicism comes from. That's where all world religions come from. Remember this, religion just don't come out of thin air. It just doesn't come out of thin air. It has to come from someplace. Where can they get it from? So it has to come from a real source, a real event that actually occurred. Well, Nimrod and Semiramis, they started their idolatry worship with the Tower of Babel. There's a reason why the Lord put a stop to that Tower of Babel. 
So Nimrod couldn't have all the people together under a one-world government and a one-world religion. So how can he retain it? In these different cultures that are scattered, they will carry his name and his uh, mother's name, and they will still worship them. As a matter of fact, Jesuits, when they went to China, they were shocked to see statues of what they saw, a mother with a baby in her arms. And they're like, that's what we got. Yeah, where did you get that from? Where did China get that from? Came from a root source. It's Nimrod and Semiramis worship. Catholicism, paganism, all world religions today. There's a book uh, by Alexander Hislop. Uh, it's important that because there are many critics out there who try to discredit the text, that you confirm it yourself through his sources and that you do the research. Right. But if you look at out, so I just don't nonchalantly say, oh, it's discredited, don't believe in it. No, I mean, there's so much documentations that it's worth to actually you yourself to consider and take a look at. If you find 10... And then you ask them, okay, give me a list, all right? You say scholars discredited it. Tell me what specifics. They're not going to tell you. They'll just say, oh, scholars discredited it. Why? Because they're lazy to do the research, and they trust in man even more than their own independent empirical research. They're not scientists, are they? Okay, anyway, let's go back to Genesis 31. Genesis 31. Let's look at Genesis chapter 31, and we will read verse 19 once more. The verse said, images. Now, image is the same thing like today, what we would say about photography, about movies. Image. There's an important reason why idol, thank you, sir, that idol is closely related to image. Why is idol so close to image? Huh. Because there is a relationship. That's the reason why this tech thing is extremely dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It is very dangerous. Yeah. Let's look at Numbers 33 and Exodus 20. Numbers 33 and then Exodus 20. Now, there's a reason why in Exodus 20, God separated the two commandments. The Catholics think that they're both the same, so they combine the two commandments together. No, you can't do that. God specifically separated it for a reason. Yep. Now, in Exodus chapter 20, God made this specific that, one, you can't have other gods, but two, you can't make a representation or an image of a God. Now, does that make sense? That means it's not just an idol which is made out of stone or a carving. This is a representation of that God. That's what Satan wants. He, you can even worship a God in your imagination. Don't you realize that? And that's what Satan wants. He wants you to have some kind of representation of him and his demonic offspring so that you can have some kind of affinity with them or relationship with them. Because why? We are seeing people. God is not made that way. He is a spirit. Yes. That's why he took things very seriously about not revealing himself. Yes. Because man has to see something in order to worship, yes. in order to have a relationship or an affiliation. Yes. Why do you think these poor generation X, Y, and Z have such a strong bond and relationship with their screen? That's very serious, but that's what the devil wants. Because we people are prone to that. Rather than something invisible, rather than by faith, rather than by hearing the words of God. The, the Bible was not made for you in pictures, you notice. It was made by words. Because God wants you to walk by faith, not by sight. That's why God split the two commandments here at Exodus chapter 20. Notice verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So 
some people might ask, well, then that means that I can't draw a picture then? No, no, that's not true. No, uh, notice that it says right here, the context is you don't bow down to them or you serve them. Right. That's very important. That's why in Korea, no, I do not believe in that, where they have a picture of a deceased loved one and then they bow down to it. No, that's not culture. That's blaspheming my Lord. I cannot do that. I cannot do that, actually. That's very different. So notice that this is all connected to idolatry. There's an affinity. Why do you think Koreans have that at a funeral? It leaves some kind of affinity that the departed loved one is not really gone, you know? Why do you think they have to have dead saints, the Catholics, to pray to as well? It remains, it keeps that bond and connection. All right, now go to Numbers 33. Now, this is supposedly your error in the King James Bible, or God knew better than the scholars, because yeah. he worded this for a reason. Look at Numbers 33, verse 52. Numbers 33, verse 52. Then he shall drive out all the inhabitants from before you and destroy all their idols. Did I read that right? What does this say? Pictures. Pictures. But modern Bible translations don't like that. Because there were no pictures that existed at that time, so we're going to put an idol. One is this. One is that if you look up that word picture in the English dictionary and look with the Hebrew, it's going to match in definition. Okay? So it may not be your version of a picture in the 21st century, all right? Because even in the 18th century, their version of picture is, our different, is different from our version of picture today. So what do you think their version of picture was during the ancient times? Obviously, KJV translators did not mean a photo op, okay? So that's dumb. Number two, it's important that word is there because God wants to emphasize that it's not some kind of wooden carving. Yes. Right. Yes. He wants to make it specific where it's an image or a, even more clear than that, picture. I'm glad the King James Bible puts picture. That's much more clear. Because if you condemn image, they might say, oh, it's a carved wooded, or, wooded idol. No, God means a picture. So Catholics talk about icons, not idols, right? They like to word that. No, that's a picture. Yeah. All right, go back. Go back. You know, because of those uh, two commandments out of the Ten Commandments, if you go to the Egyptian Museum in San Jose about the Hebrews, they interestingly mention this, that during the times of ancient Samaria culture, that cradle of civilization, that's where all civilization begins, right there. So Nimrod aimed toward that direction, obviously, to spread his idolatry. These people, when they did their writing, it was not writing. Where you get writing today is not writing. It was pictures. They, they say that the Jews claim that the beginning, when they did their writing, they never did pictures. They did writing. Why? Because of that commandment, not making a picture. Because what if they wrote the Word of God in pictures? I mean, already they got an ephod that they made that the Lord allowed, but He said not to worship, and they already were worshiping it. And if you put God's Word, because God is speaking, put that as a picture, they might have more of an excuse to worship it. Okay? So, there's, so that's the reason why uh, God, he makes it very specific that there's a distinction uh, with uh, word and picture. He makes a big deal out of that yeah. during the Old Testament. And even today, you got to be careful with your relationship with pictures, okay. your worship, your affinity with pictures. You got to be careful of that one. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis 31. And then we'll look at verse 20, verse 20. All right, we talked about verse 14 through 18, the decision to move. We now covered verse 19 about the images. Rachel steals them. Verse 20 through 25, now the chase. It's important to look at this map. So this map, I know it's kind of a little confusing, but basically this is where a Syrian region, not technically Syria itself, but the Syrian region is at, you might recall Jacob, he lived there with Laban, so he's traveling down, and as he's traveling down, he's going to Gilead. But he's crossing this little squiggly line, 
which is supposed to be the Euphrates River. Now, as I read this passage, notice how all these wordings will match up. When you read the passage, you want to picture which direction Jacob's going and how it looks. So I am going to explain it to you. And you imagine that as I explained this part. Look at Genesis chapter 31. We'll look at verse 20. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian. So Laban, he's a Syrian, which is why I mentioned Syrian region there. And uh, uh, Jacob stole away unawares, meaning that he takes away Laban's items, or it could mean that he just uh, got away sneakily out like a thief. That's the reason why that wording is similar to the rapture or the second coming of Christ, you'll notice in other passages, like a thief or unaware. So you're going to notice that. That's the reason why in verse 20, it says unawares, meaning that Laban wasn't aware. We're going to look at the next part of verse 20, in that he told him not that he fled. Uh, Jacob never told Laban that he ran away from him. Verse 21, so he fled with all that he had and he rose up and passed over the river. So Jacob fled with everything that he's got and then he rose up, he got up and then he passed the river right here, Euphrates River. So he's fleeing from the Syrian region and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. He was facing toward the direction where Mount Gilead would be. Now, there's a location called Gilead right here, but there's a mount as well. So he's heading toward that direction. This is the Dead Sea right here. You'll notice that it's like almost the northern or the middle part of Israel, probably somewhere in between there. So this is the Dead Sea region with that little, I believe, the Jordan River. Anyways, reading onwards, uh, look at verse 24. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So God, he approaches Laban, the Syrian, at a dream at night while he was sleeping. And God says to him, Be careful that you don't say anything to Jacob that will be good or bad. Now, we might wonder what does that mean? Because if you read the next verses, it sounds like Laban was saying negative stuff to Jacob. So what does that mean, good or bad? The idea is good or bad about him. Because remember, Laban always had that habit. He's a sneak. He's an influencer of people. So it's his job to flatter them and then make them feel bad. That's how you manipulate people. You know who's a good example of that? Politicians and pastors. That's why I strongly don't believe in that. I strongly believe in being honest, okay? Now, I'm not saying, like, me being so open that I, uh, without discretion, say a whole bunch of dumb stuff, but the point is I believe in being honest. I don't like this thing. Yeah. I know one when I meet one. Yeah. And guess what? I can play their game during certain fellowships. Yeah. I do that, too. I've been, I mean, yours truly went to the liberal universities, yeah. dealt with the cities over here, and that, look, I know how to play the game. Yeah. I know how to play the game. And guess what? I only do that to get back at them. Okay. Right. I don't do that with people. I only do that to yeah. people who have a habit of doing that. Right. If they're going to be a snake, I'll snake at them. I'll, I'll bite back at them as a snake. Yeah. That's my policy. All right? Fight fire with fire. Okay? Yeah. All right. Anyway, verse uh, 22. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. Now, you might notice right here that Laban heard from others who told him that on the third day, because he didn't know for three days, hey, Jacob's gone, he ran away. Verse 23, and he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days journey. So Laban, he takes his family or his people with him and then chases after Jacob, which took about seven days. Now you might see right here, Gilead is a long way. I wrote drew a line here, but what I meant was like here, okay? So Gilead is like right here. Padanaram is over here. So Jacob, he's, he's far away. If this is the Syrian region, he's already down here. So Laban had to pursue quite a distance. Let's look at verse 24. 
and they, uh, 23, the last part, and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. So he caught up with him at Gilead. 24, and God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by, uh, oh, I already read that, excuse me, okay. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 26, 26. And uh, Laban said to Jacob, what hast thou done that thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? You'll notice right here that Laban, he says to Jacob, well, what did you do? Uh, you stole away unawares, meaning, like I mentioned before, that either he took away his belongings without his awareness or he uh, just snuck away like a thief. Why did you do that to me? At verse 26, he says, stole away unawares to me and carried away, what? His daughters, like they're slaves, like they're prisoners with the sword. This guy, you can see he is a manipulator. Yeah. He is a control freak. Yeah. You can see that. He wants, to, he wants to control everybody. Verse 27, Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me? So Laban says, why did you run away from me in secret? Why did you, again that phrase, steal away from me and didn't tell me? Look at verse 27. Then I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs, with tabret and with harp. Do you know why God told Laban in a dream not to say good or bad? You can see right here already from his speech that he's trying to do flattery that he's trying to make Jacob feel guilty, good or bad. So because of that, you can see right here, Laban, he, he's hitting a limit right here. He can't freely speak as much as he wants to because that's his nature. Continuing on, so what does this mean? Uh, obviously, some of you are laughing, so you know what this means. Laban's saying, why did you... Uh, run away from me without telling me because I would have uh, let you go with uh, entertainment, amusement. That's what mirth means. With a lot of singing, tavern and harp, that's music. Yeah, sure he would. <laughs> Did you recall Genesis 30? Laban said, don't leave me. Let's make a deal. Yeah. Verse 28. And hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. So Laban, what he means right here is you didn't uh, give me the chance. You didn't allow me the chance to at least kiss my sons and my daughters goodbye. So his daughters, you can obviously guess that would be referring to Leah and Rachel. His sons would refer to grandsons. Remember that phrase in the Bible when it says son, daughter, it could refer to not just son and daughter. It could be a grandson or a great grandson. Father is the same thing. Father, grandfather, great-grandfather. Laban mourns about that and accuses Jacob, you did very foolishly. What you did was very foolish. Verse 29, it is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Laban whines, look, I have the power to hurt you, to punish you. But the God of your father came to me yesterday night and spoke to me, hey, you be careful. You don't say anything good or bad to Jacob. So Laban, see, he always kept that in mind, even though in verse 26 to 28, you can see elements of speaking good and bad to Jacob. But it's only elements because Laban, he knows that God's keeping an eye on him. So when, it, when he's talking with this to, like this to Jacob, you can see that Laban is so frustrated because right. he has such a habit of saying good and bad. So you can see the frustration here. He's hitting certain limits. Verse 30, And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? So Laban realizes he's got to let him go. He's got to let him go. Because God's watching him. Laban says right here, so now, you, I know that you have to leave. You have to be gone because you long for your dad really sorely. So sorely is like deeply. It's very deep. But even though I know you have to leave, why did you steal my gods? 
Now, notice right here, he said gods. I mean, his gods? That's some god. What a weak god. Right. You know, why did you hurt my god? That's the idea. Why did you take my god away from me? Do you realize what you're saying? How pathetic your weak your god is. Yeah. That's what you're basically showing right there. Yeah. Verse 31, And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Peradventure, thou wouldest take by forth thy daughters from me. Jacob, he, he answers Laban's complaint and says, It's because I was afraid of you. I was saying to myself that by chance there's a possibility, that's what peradventure means, that you're going to take away your daughters by force. So my wives away from me me. Verse 32, with whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren, discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. Now Jacob, he says to Laban, hey, whoever you find uh, your gods, whoever stole your gods and who has them, let that person not live. In the presence of all of us, our people, you make the discernment. You decide which one is yours amongst my stuff, where I'm at, and, you know, take it for yourself. Last part of verse 32, For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. So Jacob, he boldly gave a statement like that. Let that person die, and whatever you find is yours, hey, go ahead and take it. If he knew about Rachel, he wouldn't have made a bold statement like that. So the verse is saying, and the reason why Jacob gave a bold statement like that is because he didn't know Rachel stole the images. That's what the verse is saying. Verse 33. And Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. So the passage is pointing out right here that uh, Laban, he goes inside uh, Jacob's tent, he goes inside Leah's tent, and then... The two made uh, servants, which is obviously, remember, Jacob, he married Rachel and Leah, as well as their two maid servants. So he looked through their tents. He didn't find the idols. Now he's going to Rachel, that means. Then when he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. So he, Leah's tent was the last one, and he's now entering Rachel's. Verse 34. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture, and sat upon them. Now, notice Rachel, there's no doubt, I keep emphasizing Rachel so much right here. She is a perfect picture of a secular mindset. She is so clever. Usually people who have a secular mindset, and they are very independent, they uh, rely on themselves, and take pride on that, they're smart people. I mean, uh, usually, believe it or not, smart people, you find a good number of them prideful. Okay? So that must mean then if, uh, uh, that must mean right here that if she's so self-reliant on her own ways of doing things, then that means she's not dumb. She's got to be very, very smart to do that. It's important that women in our generation learn that. They always look up to a smart woman, independent woman, at, who's successful in the ways of the world. Don't get caught up in that, please. Yes, you do succeed, and Rachel did succeed right here. She succeeded. But she took that as confirmation to keep relying on herself. Yeah. And you don't want to go through that mess because if, you're, if you confirm your own ways of doing things, and see, nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm right, I'm smart, and okay. then God will humble you like he did with Rachel, and you know that fiasco she went through. Yeah. That wasn't fun for her. You don't want to go through that. God will humble you. But she's still very stubborn. She still clings on to that. It's in her nature, sadly. So why is this very clever? You're going to find out. So uh, meaning, verse 34, she takes the images, put them in the camel's furniture, and then she sits on the camel's furniture. For some of you who don't know the camel's furniture, the idea is, you know when people ride on a camel, there's some furniture on top of it, so to speak, furniture or a seating, and then there might be a shade or stuff like that. So that's where she put the idols at. 
And then she sits on top of the images. She's very clever because look what happens here. And Laban searched all the tent but found them not. So he looks all over Rachel's tent. He doesn't find it, the idols there. Because Rachel moved it on the camel seat that she is sitting upon. What's her reason? Verse 35, And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee. Rachel responds to her father, Hey, don't let it displease you that uh, I can't get up from my seat. Laban's in a furious mode, like, I got to find those idols. I got to find those idols. But Rachel said, uh, look, don't be displeased that I can't get up from my seat. Because the next part says, for the custom of women is upon me. Now, what does that mean? So, yes. <laughs> so, uh, the meaning of the custom of women is upon me is sometimes people might wonder if there's a custom behind that, why um, she has to sit down, she cannot rise up. Most uh, Bible commentators that I looked up and preachers, they will usually say it because it's that time of the day for her. She's going through her period, so because of that, she can't get up. And it's the custom, and it's custom and cultural of that time, which proves Rachel has a cultural mindset. She's very smart. She knew all of that. It was a culture and custom of that time that if women are going through their unclean period, whatever they touch, that you cannot touch it. Now, that was common sense custom. You'll look at the book of Leviticus. Go to the book of Leviticus. It was a common sense custom that time. 15, Leviticus 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Verse 25 through 26. Rachel didn't really need the Bible to come up with this plan. She is very clever. Leviticus 15, verse 25. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. That's self-explanatory. Verse 26. Every bed whereon she lieth, all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. So not only does she have to isolate from the people, the people cannot touch her when she's going through her moment, but even the bed she lies upon, people should not touch it. But look at the next part of verse 26. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Even where she sits, a person is not supposed to touch it. Go back. Go back. Very, very clever. People wonder, why are Jews, you know, so sneaky and clever? Well, they got a father who's sneaky and clever. They got a mother who's sneaky and clever. Oh, man. Oh, man. Very, and you wonder why they're very successful in a secular, worldly ways of doing things? Yeah, you know why? Uh, you know, it comes from the family. They all, have that, uh, they all have that success. I mean, the Jews, you have to give hats off to them, all right? Obviously, I don't praise people getting away with sneaky stuff, but you got to give hats off to the Jews. They went through so much repression, uh, genocide, and being kicked out of their country. They were kicked out for nearly two millennia. They survived, and they even thrived. The majority of medical doctors that you look at within... Uh, the most successful. And what you're going to find out, the Jews don't make up uh, 1%, but they make up the majority. <laughs> a huge percentage. Very successful people. God, he knows what he's doing. So when he says that you're going to be physically blessed, he's going to even use the things in life to accomplish his purpose. So notice right here, he can even use the evil for good. He'll use it either way. So that's why, good advice, don't be anti-Semite. Don't touch the Jew. That's God's people. All right? Don't do that. You got to let the Lord handle them. Okay. Uh, Genesis chapter 31, and then we'll read verse, um, let's see right here, verse 35, the last part. And he searched, but found not the images. So uh, Laban, he searched everywhere, 
but he still couldn't find the images. And obviously he didn't look at the camel's furniture that Rachel was sitting on. Verse 36, and Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. So Jacob got angry and I mean, he was scoffing. He was deriding, criticizing Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? And Jacob answers and says to Laban, look at this. This is sly guy versus sly guy. All right. And you wonder why Syria and Israel never get along. All right. Laban the Syrian and Jacob the Jew. Oh, my goodness. It's so notice right here, I do not condone Israel's policies just because I believe that they're God's people. I don't condone or approve their policies. The, the way that Israel and Syria is doing things is the same thing you see in this passage with Laban the Syrian and Jacob the Jew. Just flesh debating flesh. It's just so silly. And God deals with both of them. Okay, uh, Jacob, he responds to Laban, Hey, what's, what wrong thing that I've done? That's a trespass. What sin did I commit that you would be so hotly, you would go in hot pursuit, right? That's where we get that phrase from. So remember that, so notice that's very archaic that police officers don't use that nowadays, all right? So archaic, we got to change that. Hotly pursued after me, that you went on a hot pursuit after me. Verse 37. Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast, thou found, uh, uh, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? So here you are, uh, you are searching everywhere in my stuff, and where did you find any of your household stuff anywhere? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge betwixt us both. Oh, self-righteous uh, person, this guy. This guy is trying to prove a point. Hey, did you find anything that belonged to you? Set it here before my people and your people that they may all judge between the both of us. You can, huh? See, I'm right. You're wrong, you know. Verse 38. This 20 years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young. And the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. Jacob's going on a long spiel here. He's like, 20 years I've been with you. And you know, uh, your she-goats and then the female lambs, right? Ewes and she-goats, they did not miscarry. That's the idea. Have not, cast, uh, have not cast their young. If you look up the word cast, it actually means premature birth. It could actually mean premature birth. And the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. I didn't eat a single ram from your flock. Yeah, but you didn't tell him about, you know, that weird genetics thing, population control that you did. You weird, uh, you weird Jewish elitist, you, you, know, you weird guy, you know, keeping it to yourself. Verse 39, that which was torn a beast I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Look at Jacob. He's saying right here, you know, any, anything from the flock that was torn by beasts, that was ruined by wild animals, I didn't bring it to you. I bore the loss of it. My hand, from my hand, you required it from me. So I made sure to pay up for that. If it was stolen by day or even by night, I made sure to reimburse you. Verse 40, thus I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night. Boo-hoo. And the sleep departed from my eyes. Liberal Jew. Liberal Jew. You know, using a victimization card and whining about everything, about mistreatment and all that. Uh, well, you can learn a lot here about human nature, can you? Or even uh, di uh, how, different, how different people carry on from their ancestors. Usually what I find with people is you're just repeating a cycle from your ancestors back then. What I see today is history unveiling. So Jacob whines, so thus I was, meaning verse 39. So here I was doing all of that and bore the loss. At the daytime, the drought was consuming me. And then at nighttime, the frost was so cold and the sleep just left my eyes. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Every, every generation is now doing that right now. 
You know, so give me a, uh, so you, uh, they, you know what they want? They don't want to be happy with each other. Let's speak from a secular perspective. Different nationalities and cultures do not actually want to get along with each other and be happy with each other. They want to complain about their pain and make sure the other person pays the loss of it. Yeah. All right, anyway, I'm not going to park it there. All right, verse 41. Uh, verse 41, thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I was living all of this in a minority repression and being your slave because my ancestors were slaves and you got to make, you got to pay up the cost, you know. 20 years in your house, I served you, he says right here, I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages ten times. And Jacob mourns, you know, I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your cattle and you changed my wages ten times. Yeah, where's your tenth, your tithe to the Lord you promised, Jacob? Maybe the Lord did that for a reason. Okay, so Jacob, uh, let's be honest here. Jacob does have some rights to complain. Laban did oppress him. But it's the same thing with human nature today. Will they have some rights to complain about their oppression? Sure, you can find some good points, but they're not being honest. Like Jacob. There are some things you want to take advantage of. I'm preaching here because I really hate uh, this liberal culture, this liberal community, and this must be preached hard against. You wonder why everybody's falling apart and then there are riots, not peaceful discussions on what to do with life. All right, verse 42. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hast sent me away now empty. Oh, Jacob, he takes advantage of that. See, in Laban's statement in verse 29, Laban gave a little leeway. He gave a little leeway because of the God of your fathers. That's why I can't do it against you. And you know what people who are oppressed will do, you know? They're going to take advantage of the leeway you gave them. You give one little leeway or handout, they will take it an extra mile long. Why? Because that's human nature. And no, I'm not talking about only poor people and bums. No, I'm talking about you, all of you, including yours truly. It's a human nature thing. I would probably be worse right now. I would probably be the guy in front of that church. I would, I'm no better than them. I could have been that guy in front of that church building while you're all here worshiping the Lord. You know, I could have been that person. That could have been you. That could have been you. All right? That's why we got to witness to them. That's why we got to preach against this. That's why we got to help them. Okay, anyways, verse uh, chapter 31, verse 42. So Jacob takes advantage of it, you know. Where Laban, he gives that exception that the God of your forefathers, if it hadn't been for that, I would have done this evil to you. So Jacob takes full advantage and says, you know, if it weren't for the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, so because of Isaac's God, there is a fear with Isaac's ancestry. So Laban, he does have that fear. He does have that fear. If that hadn't been with me, Surely you would have sent me away now empty. Surely you would have uh, let me go away empty and taken all this stuff. Actually, that's very true. You know, uh, the Jew is able to get away with a lot now because had it not been the fear of the Lord and your God, the God of your forefathers, you would have been gone a long time ago. Yeah. It's not your own cultural doings or your secular ways. It's the Lord. Jacob had enough sense to realize that much, even though he lived by the secular ways of the world to survive and to thrive. But even Jacob knew that, hey, God is the one who took care of me. Uh, the next part of verse 42, God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesterday night. <laughs> God saw my pain and how hard I worked. So that's why he rebuked you yesterday night. Yeah. Verse 43, all right. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle. You can really, this is a perfect chapter 
on Syria and Israel diplomatic relations. This is mine. No, this is mine. This is mine. This is mine. I worked hard for this. No, you stole away my home and I have no place to live. No, I deserved it. I worked hard. And this is the perfect chapter yeah. yep. for the current diplomatic relations and the silly fights between the uh, Arabic people and as well as Jacob's people, as well as the Syrian people. Oh, it's what a United Nations conference is going on right here. So Laban, he's, uh, he's just ups as much upset as Jacob. So he, J uh, Laban answer and says to Jacob, so I will explain verse 43 uh, next time. So we see right here the confrontation that was made. Rachel had a plan. Jacob gave his complaint. And then we're going to come down to the covenant. Okay, we're going to come down to the covenant that they make. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers and increased our knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.